Thank you. Please be seated. And the state will call the next witness, please. I call Denise Jones from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Had a discussion with every witness about whether they are willing to or believe they can safely and responsibly testify without a mask but i've not ordered anyone to do so uh, is it your preference to remain masked at this time or could you testify without i'd prefer to have it on very good then if you can pull the microphone really close because it does have a tendency to muffle um, and we'll make sure that we can hear you and that the jury can hear you thank you go ahead good afternoon could you please state and spell your name for the court denise jones D-E-N-I-S-E-J-O-N-E-S. -E -E and what do you do for a living? I'm a senior forensic scientist in the DNA analysis unit at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in Madison. How long have you been employed by the Wisconsin State uh, Crime Lab? 14 and a half years. Uh, what, do you, what are your duties and responsibilities there? I examine evidence for the presence of biological stains, such as blood, semen, and saliva. I extract DNA from those stains and make comparisons to known um, individuals. I write reports on my findings, and I testify in court if necessary. Uh, could you tell us about your educational background? I received my Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 2001, and I received my Master's of Science in Bacteriology from the U University of Wisconsin Madison in 2004. Have you received any specialized training in the field of uh, serology, DNA, statistics, things of that sort? Yes, I received nine months of training upon, um, bef on DNA analysis prior to doing casework. I also received training on statistics and STARMIX um, for about two months prior to doing it to casework. I'm required to take eight hours of continuing education every year. Uh, have you prior, uh, prior to today and previously, have you testified as an expert in court? Yes, this is my 48th time. Um, can you tell us, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the laboratory, the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. Is that an accredited lab? Yes, it is. And what does that mean? It means we uh, meet reliable, accurate, and reliable testing. Sure. Uh, does you, do you and your lab undergo any sort of proficiency testing? Yes, I am required to go, undergo two proficiency tests a year. Okay. What do those consist of? It's uh, samples that we would see in casework and to see if we can accurately and reliably do DNA analysis. What is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the DNA we inherit from our parents. We inherit 50% from our fathers and 50% from our mothers. And it codes for all structure and function in our body. And DNA is found in every cell in the body except for red blood cells. So it's found in skin cells, white blood cells, and sperm cells. How is DNA used in forensic science? So most of our DNA is similar person to person, but there are specific areas that distinguish us from um, others. And it's those areas that we look at um, in DNA in forensics. Um, everyone will have differences except identical siblings. We look at 23 of these genetic markers and one that's specific for gender. Sure. Uh, you said everyone will have different DNA um, other than identical siblings? That's correct. Okay. Um, can you tell us how DNA testing is conducted at the laboratory? Can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. Uh, what's the steps for, for conducting DNA testing uh, when you're at the crime lab? So we have uh, multiple steps in the DNA analysis process. We have what's called extraction, which we are extracting the DNA from um, the sample or opening up the cell to get the DNA. We have quantitation, which allows us to determine how much DNA is in a sample, which will allow us to know whether or not we need to go on for further testing. 
And currently our kits, we can determine how much human DNA is present, how much male DNA is present, and whether or not we can detect degradation or inhibition in the sample. Are these methods of testing uh, and typing generally accepted by the scientific community? Uh, yes. And do the majority of forensic scientists use these methods that you use? Yes. Uh, are there multiple levels of review uh, conducted to ensure that the correct procedures are followed in each case? Yes, we have what's called technical review, which another qualified analyst also reviews the case file and report and um, looks to see that I followed our procedure manual correctly for interpretation, statistics, and notes. I'm showing you what's been marked in this case is exhibit number uh, 380. Uh, this will just be brief, but can you tell me what that is? Uh, that's a copy of my statement of qualifications. And does that list uh, your training and education in this field uh, making you qualified to, to comment on some of the matters you're going to comment on today? Yes. I'll move 380 into evidence. No objection. Thank you. It is received. At times over the past year, uh, since July of, of this year, uh, have you been asked to become involved at various times into an investigation into a homicide that occurred over in Windsor uh, involving some people uh, with the names of Bart Halderson, Krista Halderson, Chandler Halderson? Yes. Uh, and have you produced numerous reports related to uh, your analysis of separate items that have been submitted to you over that course of time? Yes, I believe four reports. Okay. Can I briefly ask you, uh, how, who makes the decision to submit items to the crime lab? That's up to the agency to submit, but then we also have submission guidelines in place on certain types of cases of how many items we'll allow um, upon submission. But as long as we have a meeting with the agency, we may allow more. Sure. Uh, in general, in most cases, what is that limit of items that can be submitted? 10 for homicides. And was that far exceeded in this case? Yes. Okay. And you were, in fact, the one who had to do with the testing? Yes. Okay. I'm showing you what's been marked in this case. I'm going to show you all four exhibits at once, and then we'll go through them. Um, can you tell us what exhibit number 383 is, just briefly? And you might want to turn one page in. Uh, this is my report dated July 29th. It has my signature on it. And does that appear to be a true and accurate copy of your report? Yes. I'll show you what's been marked in this case is exhibit number 417. Uh, same question, turn a couple of pages, turn a page in and let me know what that is. This is my report dated September 1st, 2021. And does that appear to be a true and accurate report or a copy of the report on that date? It appears to be. Okay, I'll take that one from you. Uh, showing you what's been marked is exhibit number 418, same questions. Uh, this is a report dated October 6, 2021, that I authored. Okay. And appear to be a true and accurate copy? Yes. Right. And lastly, uh, 560, same questions. This appears to be a report that I authored dated November 8, 2021. True and accurate copy? Yes. At this time, uh, Judge, I'll move uh, for 17, 18, 383 and 560 in evidence. Any objection? No objection. They are all received. And I'll move to publish. You may publish. Ms. Jones, in, in preparation for testifying today, um, in order to make this a, a more visually understandable experience for everyone, um, you understand that your report has been maybe cut apart and put into a PowerPoint for everyone to see? Yes. Okay. Uh, and so, We'll start with, uh, you were asked to perform a report, July, and you did write a report on July 29th, 2021. Was this your first report in this case? Yes, it was. Okay. And as I'm talking about each report, um, in fact, I'll just uh, give you a copy, and you can go ahead and just let us know if you're referencing that report, okay? And I see you brought some materials with you. If you need to reference anything, you can just let us know that you need to refresh your recollection, and, and we'll let you go ahead and do that. Just so there's a clear record, we'll just say that out loud, even though it might be a a tad awkward or not normal. Um, we'll go through this one uh, somewhat slowly so everyone can understand maybe how these reports take form. Uh, but the first section of your report, we talk about items examined. So what did you examine here? Uh, I examined a dried blood standard reportedly from Bart Halderson 
an electric toothbrush head reportedly used by Krista Halderson, and then some samples reportedly of human remains, um, K1 through K6 of differing body parts, and then a buckle swab standard reportedly from Mitchell Halderson. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna show you a couple of these items uh, just so we're talking about the same thing. I'm gonna show you what's been uh, received into evidence um, already in this case. Uh, it's been labeled with the exhibit sticker 194 and it's labeled electric toothbrush head. Um, we're not gonna open it or anything, uh, but do you see anything on there that indicates that item has been to the lab? It has our yellow barcode label with the case number and the item number. And the okay. case number in this case is what? M21-1575. And what is an item number? It's just the item that we uh, give each item that comes into the lab. Okay, so while the police may have labeled it with, with a letter or a number, and maybe in court, we put a sticker on it with a different number, you have your own system and you put your own letter to it? Yes. Okay, and what letter is that? Item I. All right, same question with the item labeled uh, Mr. Halderson DNA spot card. Um, what item is that? That is M21-1575 item B. For the record, we're talking about exhibit 372 and then 361. Um, what item is that? It's M21-1575 item N. Okay, so these items come into the lab. Um, can you tell me just a bit, um, and we won't do this for each item, but when the police bring you out an item, how are they processed in? Um, I imagine there's not just a mailbox out front that there's some process for this. Um, they usually um, meet with an evidence specialist that will um, take inventory of all the items and then give them a receipt of their items. Okay. And then they create the case and all the item numbers in our limb system. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and here it says preparation for analysis. In your report, what does preparation for analysis mean? It means when I took swabbings or cuttings from each of these items, uh, I took a portion of that item and so I'm sub-designating the cuttings or the swabbings that I took for each item. So on the left, the um, we have the sample name and in the middle is what the parent item is. And then we have the sub-designation of what I made of the cuttings or the swabbings I took from those items. Okay, so if you take a swab of say item B, which is the, the, the Bart Halderson blood standard from the medical examiner office, you take a cotton swab and then you cut something off that swab. Well, it was a blood standard given, so I just cut a portion of the dried blood standard and then I sub-designated it as B1. Okay. So some of the original remains? Uh, original blood that was given to me, yes. Okay. And do when we sub-designate something, and again, we'll go through this one a little bit more carefully and, and I think everyone will get the hang of it in a second, but when we sub-designate something, um, is it always carry that same letter and then add usually either a number or a letter to it? either depending on what the parent item is. So in this instance, there's item B. So that the sub designation would be B1. And then um, for um, the portion cut from the left leg tissue, the item was K1, but the sub designation I made was K1A. Okay. Um, after you prepare them for analysis, I imagine you, you do some sort of DNA isolation? Uh, yes, we ex um, called, this is, um, the quantification results that we got from the items that I did the DNA extraction on. And this table just explains the results of those quantitation and whether or not they went on for further analysis. Sure. Um, so in item B1 and N1, and we'll, we'll just use B1 as an example um, here, uh, meaning it was the blood standard. Um, here you indicate you found human DNA. Right, um, when we do standard extractions, we typically go from extraction right into the amplification stage. We don't usually quantify these standards unless there's a necessity to do it. And uh, when in the further testing column, it says autosomal STR, what does that mean? That's the amplification that we use to detect um, human or DNA profiles from. Uh, when we go to K2A, uh, K5A, and K6A, could you remind us again, based on the report, what were those items where it says, because here it says, of course, human DNA, human DNA not detected. What were K2A, K5A, and K6A? What were those cuttings of? Uh, K2A was a cutting of uh, reported left thigh tissue, 
and then K5A and K6A were swabbings of the hollow area of the left and right thigh bones. Okay. And I made this slide to maybe highlight that, uh, again, going through this one more carefully for the jury. Um, here you actually had portions of, of thigh tissue that you were not able to, de to detect DNA on? That's correct. And um, as an analyst, uh, is that something that can be explained or, or do you have any comments on how possibly part of, of a cutting from a, a human thigh tissue, was, there was no DNA detectable on that? Um, the item received when I examined it did not really appear to have a lot of pink tissue. Um, it was very whitish in color and it had a distinct odor to it um, when examining it. So I knew I would probably have a difficult time of getting DNA recovered from that. Based on my experience, items like those are difficult to recover DNA from due to a possible bacterial activity inhibiting the ability to recover DNA. Okay, so sometimes bacterial activity or being in, things being in the elements and subjected to that can have an impact on whether you can obtain the DNA? Yes. Uh, but you were able to identify uh, or find DNA or detect DNA uh, from K1A, which is of the same you know, general items. Uh, K1A was left leg tissue. Okay. And so, so next you uh, have some standards. So you have the dry blood standard uh, from Bart Halderson, item B1, uh, and then you have Mitchell Halderson, which you labeled as N1, um, and you have single source profile. What does the single source profile mean? When we um, get the data um, after amplification and typing the DNA, we interpret the DNA and we can determine whether the uh, profile is from one contributor, which is a single source profile, or from more than one person, which is a mixture. And in this case, when I was doing the analysis of the data, both of these items appeared to be from single source individuals. And when we look at the swabbing of the bristles on the electric toothbrush head um, and that you say reportedly was used by Krista Halderson, um, what does that mean when you wrote single source female profile? Uh, could explain that. So we have the ability in our amplification kit that has one area that we can determine gender. And in this case, females will have an XX and the male will have an XY. And when I, interpreting this profile, there was only the X for the gender, indicating it was a female single source profile. Um, moving to the next portion, uh, you start talking about this item K1A in which you, had, you were able to isolate or detect some DNA. Uh, tell us what this section of your report means. So the result is that I got a partial single source female profile, which means I didn't get a complete profile, but I got a, a, a pretty good profile from it. Out of the 23 markers that we do amplification, amplification on, I had 22 of them. And so that makes it a partial profile. And then I compared that partial profile to the swabbing, to the profile I got from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush head. And Krista Halderson was considered the source of that profile. And understanding at that time, uh, identifying Krista Halderson and her remains was important. Did you then use the buckle swab or the single source profile from um, their, their reported son, Mitchell, uh, as well as what you knew to be Bart to try to come to some sort of conclusions as well? Yes, I did a, a, a paternity to determine whether or not those remains could also be a, the possible biological mother of Mitchell Halderson, knowing that Bart Halderson was the biological father. And it was at least four, 413 billion times more likely to observe the profile from Mitchell Halderson if the female profile detected from the left leg tissue is his biological mother than if it's a random unrelated female in the uh, unrelated female is the mother. Uh, fair to say a good part of this report was simply determining the sources uh, the, of the DNA. So you had Krista, Bart, uh, Mitchell, and eventually you, were, you obtained uh, Chandler Halderson's DNA, correct? Yes. Uh, you then wrote another report on uh, September 1st, and I'll bring that one to you. That's labeled as exhibit number 417. Fair to say in this report, we start testing um, pieces of evidence, maybe the more traditional thing that, that folks might think about when they think of your job. We're, we're talking about evidence that was collected. Yes. 
you examined a lot of items, correct? Yes. Right. I think you talked about examining here a, a garbage bin, uh, item C2, a tarp that was sub-designated C2, meaning it was inside the garbage bin, I would imagine? Oh, there were two items. Um, the parent item was item C that was a garbage bin and a tarp, and then we sub-designated the garbage bin and the tarp as two separate items. Right. Uh, and then you labeled uh, item D, scissors, item E, a broken saw blade, item F, a handsaw, item G, pruning shears, item L and M, both metal fragments, item P, uh, a buckle swab from Chandler Halderson, and item S, uh, a tarp that was recovered from a barn. That's correct. Okay. You did some blood testing uh, on some of these items, correct? Yes. Um, let's talk about that. Um, we heard yesterday from um, Deputy Leatherberry, who testified extensively about some of the blood tests he did. Uh, what does it mean when you uh, write this in your report that you identified blood? So when we identify blood in the lab, it's similar to the testing is similar to a pregnancy test or a COVID test where we're taking a little bit of the sample, adding some liquid reagent to it, and then adding it to a card. And for us to say um, blood was identified, we must see two lines. And if we only get one line, then blood was not detected on the item. And in this case, we had two, I had two positive lines when testing these items. So blood was identified on all of these items. And uh, Ms. Jones, if you wouldn't mind, uh, would you step up here for a second and we'll start talking first about item C that you sub-designated C1 and 2. I'll move the rest of them, but I can't move one of them. Um, could you take a look at this large item, uh, this box that's in here? I believe this has been marked as an exhibit in this case, as exhibit number 14. And we don't have to open it, and, and um, I know there's reasons it's secured at this point. Um, but could you let me know, do those stickers appear to be uh, from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab and appear to be what you've labeled as item C, then sub-designated C1 and C2? Yes. Okay. Um, you can take a seat again. In the garbage bin, item C1, uh, you indicate you were able to identify blood. Do you recall where you were able to identify blood in the garbage bin? Can I refer to my notes? You can. Just let us know when you've refreshed your recollection. Uh, I recovered, I recovered, uh, or I tested um, a swab that was from a stain near where the tape was inside the garbage bin. And that was positive for blood? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then as to the tarp that's inside uh, item C2, same question, um, was that a swab of one of the stains on the tarp? Both of them were, yes. So item C2 and then um, I promised you that I, I'd carry the rest. Um, this, I think, has been identified and, and perhaps colloquially called the barn tarp, a tarp purportedly recovered from a barn in the Irwin Road property. Uh, does that appear to be, have your lab sticker on it? Yes, it's uh, M21-1575, item S. Okay, excellent. And we won't open this, and I understand why, uh, but on this, you were able to identify blood as well? Yes. And was that on staining that you were able to, to observe? Yes. Um, the detective's actually going to assist me for a little bit because we're going to maybe look at some of these items. Next, we're going to talk about item D, uh, which is the scissors, which has been marked in this case as exhibit number 142. So uh, the detective actually just approached you with that, if that's okay. Same question. Is that the item, those scissors that you were able to look at at the crime lab? Uh, it, ha it has our um, designation of M21-1575 item D. Okay, and we don't have to open that right now. We can actually probably just sit it right there because we're gonna come back to it. But on the scissors, were you able to detect blood? Yes. And do you know where? Uh, can I refer to my notes? Yes, just let us know when you've refreshed your memory. I detect, I identify blood on the blade of the scissors. Okay. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about the uh, broken saw blade. 
I believe that's been received into evidence as exhibit number 141. We'll have the detective approach you with it. If you could look at that, make sure your lab sticker's on there, and we'll leave it with the scissors. It appears to have our barcode M21-1575 item E on it. Okay. For everyone's reference, at exhibit 141, I believe broken saw blade testified to being recovered at the Irwin Road property. Um, were you able to detect blood on that saw blade? Yes. And where on the blade? Or was it just a swab of the blade in general? It was the teeth of the blade. Okay. Uh, next item F. Uh, we're just going to move that up there. Uh, this is a, uh, I believe, received into evidence in this case. And it's exhibit number 140, uh, an all-way brand handsaw. Yes, it has our, our barcode label on it, M21-1575, item F. And were you able to detect blood on that item? Yes. And do you know where? On the blade. Okay. Uh, and next, we're going to look at item G, uh, same process. I appreciate the detective helping us out. Um, if you could just confirm the lab stickers on there. Yes, it has our barcode M21-1575, item G. Okay. Are you always able to conduct a blood test on samples you receive? Not always. In what situations are you not? Depending on um, how much staining is on an item, if there's very little staining on it, it's up to the analyst, maybe in discussion with the agency or on their own, to only go on for DNA analysis um, because there won't be enough to test for blood and do DNA because we're taking a portion of that stain to do the screening test for blood. There might not be enough to do DNA analysis. So for us, it's more important to get a DNA profile from that than maybe doing screening on it. In this specific case, did you work um, in conjunction with uh, detectives and investigators, including um, Deputy Leatherberry, regarding items being submitted to the lab? Yes. Are you aware that sometimes he was performing tests to, the, to detect blood or human blood himself? Yes. And if those situations came up or, or arose regarding a very limited amount and he had already performed a test, there would be a discussion about maybe it being more important to do DNA analysis on your part? Yes. Okay. Um, you prepared these items for analysis, and, and we, we don't have to explain it again, but essentially you took swabs, and, and there's some cuttings of those swabs, correct? Yes. All right. And there, you're able to do some analysis. So in each one, uh, you're able to, to figure out if there's human DNA present, perhaps male DNA present, and then decide whether there's further testing uh, that you can do. Yes. Okay. Um, and let's just take an example um, uh, of a couple different, there's three different ways you've responded here. Item C1, uh, B1, uh, which was a portion of the swab cut from the inside lip of the garbage bin. Uh, here it says human DNA present, male DNA present, but not selected for further testing. Can you tell us why? Like I was explaining quantitation, our kit has the ability to detect human and male DNA, but we also have the ability to determine whether or not the sample has inhibition or degradation. And in this case, the sample had a very high degradation rate. And if this went on for um, further analysis, I would likely not get um, something interpretable for DNA. And there were plenty of other items that would, were going on for further testing. So this one was not selected. Okay. The next possible re result in the further testing column is, is for most of them, you write uh, autosomal STR. What does that mean? That means it went on to amplification, um, which is the DNA making copies of itself, and then going on for typing, which is taking that amplified DNA um, to detect a profile. And the other option here is we see for item C2, uh, I1, and S3A, uh, you write um, unsuitable. What does unsuitable mean, and what, why is that different than not selected? So in the human DNA column, I have um, limited human DNA, and I also have limited male DNA. And based on those results, they were below our threshold for samples to go on for further analysis. So these samples were not taken for further analysis, so no DNA profile was developed from these items. Okay. Uh, the next item we're going to look at is, is, and I'll have the detective if he wants to grab uh, Mr. Halderson's uh, buckle, and I'll approach you with that. Um, but you had, from your July 29th report, you had some standards, meaning you had the single source profile of Bart Halderson and Mitchell Halderson. 
Yes. Okay. And you, based on the toothbrush head and your analysis, you believed you had Krista Halverson? Yes. Okay. And in this report, September 1st, you were provided uh, a buckle swab purportedly obtained from Chandler Halverson? Yes. Okay. Judge, can we approach real quick? Yes. All right, and I know we've, we've looked at the other swabs previously, or the source profiles, but could you tell me, I'm showing you it's been marked as exhibit number 360, could you tell me what that is? That's the Crime Lab's um, item designation, M21-1575, item P. And uh, what does this appear to be to you? A buckle swab standard from Chandler Halderson. At that point, you did some analysis on all of these items using those source profiles. Is that correct? I used, I made comparisons from the buckle swab standards to the evidence profiles developed. Okay. And we're going to talk about those. Um, why are some of these grouped up in maybe one uh, major result and, and some of them separated out individually? Uh, this one was grouped together because it was uh, the same male profile was detected from all of these items. So we like to group them together to kind of condense the report so it's not even longer than it already is. Okay. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and so I'm going to show you some items, but let's start with um, here. You say the swabbings from the stains. I think you testified there was blood on item C2, and there were some sub-designations there, D1, G1, and H1. What do those sub-designations mean again? They're just um, different areas of the tarps that I swab. Uh, and then the cuttings that I took from those swabs that I took from the tarp. And what was your conclusion related to the, the stains on that tarp that was found in the garbage cans, the, at least the swabs C2D1, C2G1, and C2H1? They were a single source male profiles from the same individual. And who was that individual? Bart Halderson was the source. Uh, is there any uh, numerical value attached to when you say someone is the source? For us to consider someone the source, the profile that we cal the stat that we calculate, the profile has to be rarer than one in seven trillion individuals, which is 1,000 times the world's population. And here you say Krista, Mitchell, and Chandler are excluded. What does it mean for someone to be excluded? They are not the source of that profile. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last line, additional possible trace alleles were detected uh, and it goes on. What does that line mean? It means when I was examining or analyzing the data from items F2 and L1, there were a couple minor types seen um, that I couldn't really say anything about. They could be just um, non-true peaks or artifacts from the amplification project. Um, so they're a trace alleles, and I'm not making any conclusions on those. Excellent. And the next item uh, that's in this grouping is the swabbing of the staining. I think you've already testified about on the teeth blade of the handsaw, uh, item F2. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to have the detective who's, who's masked and, and gloved up with clean gloves, I would imagine, uh, remove F2 uh, from the box and just display to the jury. So we're, we're recalling the same item. And 
First, I'll have uh, the analyst look at that. Is that, in fact, the item that we're talking about? Yes. And I'll have the detective just remove that, and I'll ask you some questions about it. And I'll have him walk in front of the jury, and I'll ask you a couple of questions. Um, what was your conclusion related to the swabbing of the staining on that, that saw? And I think it's been testified, purportedly recovered at the Irwin Road property. It was a single source male profile. And uh, who was that profile? Bart Halderson was and, the source of that profile. And that numerical value you gave previously, um, same answer for this one? Yes. So I'll ask the detective to re-glove at this point. The next item we'll talk about, and just to make sure we're all looking at the same thing, we'll remove it again. Uh, you swabbed the stains on the clippers, or the ends of the pruning shears, which was item G3? Yes. Okay. And first off, we'll show you the box. Is that, in fact, the item that we're discussing? Yes. All right, and I'll have the detective display it to the jury while I ask you the question. <laughs> item G3, uh, what were your conclusions as to that item? It was a single source male profile, and Bart Halderson was the source of that profile. Turn that item to the box. Next, there are two items, and as the detective gets ready, uh, L1 and M1. Um, you list them as metal fragments, but you say something that we haven't seen yet, which is washings of. What does that mean, a washing of something? That means the item was small enough that I could actually place the item in a tube and add reagent to it. And it's what we call a washing because it's not a swabbing and it's not a cutting of. We're washing that item to recover any DNA that may be from it. And then we remove the item from the liquid and then that goes on for DNA extraction. Sure. Do you find that to be a reliable method? Yes, we use it in other items of evidence, too. Okay. Uh, and um, we're going to show you what's been marked. And again, we're not opening these. Uh, show you what's been marked in this case is exhibit number 285 and 286. I believe testified from uh, investigator Leatherberry as metal fragments recovered from the uh, basement of the Halderson home. Are those the items that we're discussing? Yes. A and uh, did you, in fact, wash those items? Yes, I did. Were these items you were able to perform blood tests on? No, based on the limited amount of sample size, it went on for DNA analysis. Sure. And uh, what was the result of the DNA analysis on items L1 and M1, which is also, I guess, for our purposes, exhibits 285 and 286? They were single source male profiles from the same individual, and Bart Halderson was the source of that profile. Okay. Uh, next, um, and we're just going to go through the whole report, even when it, it maybe didn't lead to anything. Uh, here you indicate the swab from the stain on the tarp, item C2E1. Was this another stain you found on the tarp? Yes. And uh, for everyone's purposes is, is item C and then C2 the sub-designation? Yes. Um, and you say partial low-level profile not suitable for comparisons uh, due to limited amount of genetic information. Just explain that for us. So sometimes when we develop DNA profiles, we don't get, sometimes we don't get great profiles. And in this case, um, that was the instance where I didn't get anything that I could really make any conclusions on. So our procedure is to say a partial low-level profile and not make any comparisons to it. Okay. Um, 
you were able to uh, find some comparisons, however, with other areas of that same TARP. Yes. Okay. And so now we're looking at your testing done on item C2F1, uh, which we talk about the TARP, talking about the, the one in the garbage can, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and what conclusions did you reach regarding that staining? I detected a single source female profile and Krista Halderson was the source of that profile. Uh, same numerical value that you previously gave regarding the sample? Yes. What is StarMix? StarMix is a probabilistic genome typing software that we use in the lab and it has the ability to deconvolute um, complex mixtures and then perform likelihood ratio calculations on those profiles when given a, a standard for reference. And because of my question, perhaps we're about to see some, um, some of that testing done in this case of those results, correct? Yes. All right. Um, can you explain what a likelihood ratio is? If you wanna to go to the next slide, I can. Sure. So here, um, for everyone's purposes, we're looking at uh, star mix slide or the, from your lab report labeled swab from stain near where tape was inside garbage bin on item C1, C1. Uh, talk about this. So a likelihood ratio is a ratio of two different hypotheses and the statistic calculated gives support for one hypothesis over the other. So in this case, the top part of the table, it says H1, that's the first hypothesis and that consists usually of the person of interest and an unknown individual, because in this case, it's a two person mixture. So the person of interest and an unknown individual. And then the second hypothesis is that it's two unknown individuals. How do you construct those likelihood ratio proportions? It's based on the case information that we are given. And like I said, H1 is usually a hypothesis that the person of interest is included in that and H2 is a hypothesis where the person of interest is not included. Okay. And when you say person of interest, do you mean any of these standards being the person of interest? Yes, on the left side of the table, each standard that I made a comparison to there listed. So it's Bart Halderson, Krista Halderson, Mitchell Halderson, and Chandler Halderson's. Each of their standards were compared to the evidence profile in this case. Um, in this case, you use StarMix? Yes. Can you tell us why? Um, based on our procedure manual, I needed to use StarMix in this case. Sure. Uh, what is the mathematical process used by StarMix? The mathematical process is a random resampling and it, it, to be able to best explain the data and all the possible genotypes that could be um, part of this profile. Okay. Uh, are the methods you've described here for StarMix, are they generally accepted by, by people who do what you do for a living? Yes. Um, so let's start talking about it. Uh, and so as we go through, we're gonna see some of the more simple line results, and then maybe we're gonna see some more complex ones. This is StarMix? Yes. All right. Um, when we're looking at this, let's start from the top. We're talking about a stain near where the tape was inside item C1, um, uh, this large box here, and uh, Tell us what the jury is looking at here. So you're looking at the table of the results and the conclusions from this. The first part says that it was a partial low level two person mixture. So when I was doing the analysis of the, of the profile, I determined that more than one person contributed to this profile. And I knew that at least one male was included. So then that information is given to StarMix and it deconvolutes the mixture and lets me know if it uh, has good results that I can go and do statistics from standards on. And in this case, it did. And then I have each standard compared to that profile and it gives me a, res a statistic of whether or not they can be included or excluded or uninformative. In dealing with a situation in which every person of interest, and not using the term person of interest as a police officer might, and as I, I think you robbed the Walmart, as in person of interest meaning the, the person who you believe possibly might be the, have their DNA included in this mix, um, sometimes is it possible to see people who are biologically related have small support or moderate support for inclusion? Yes, it's possible. And I think when you started talking, 
at the beginning, you indicated that uh, we get our DNA from our parents. Yes. Uh, and just what amount of DNA do you get from your parents? You get 50% from your father's and 50% from your mother. Sure. Uh, and here you, you reach some sort of qualifier as to your conclusion, very strong support, uninformative, moderate support, things of that sort. Um, yes. Okay, uh, let's start at the top. For Mr. Bart Halderson, um, related to the staining on the, where the tape was inside the garbage bin, uh, what was your conclusion? That it was at least 43 billion times more likely to observe this DNA profile as a mixture from H1, which is person of interest plus unknown, than if it's a mixture resulting from H2, which is from two unknown individuals. Okay. And Krista, it's uninformative? Yes. Meaning? I'm not making any type of conclusions on if they're included or excluded based on the statistic calculate. And for Mitchell Halderson, it's indicated as moderate support for inclusion. Yes. And I exp explain again, if you could, uh, what moderate support for inclusion means. The moderate support for inclusion was um, developed when we did our validation, and it was um, determined that it was a support for inclu inclusion, but it was just above our cutoff. What is, the, what is that cutoff? 1,000. And what is Mitchell? 2,670 times more likely. Uh, compared to where we, you find very strong support with BART, it was 43 billion times more likely. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, lastly, for Chandler Halderson, you wrote uninformative? Yes. All right. Um, here now we're talking about the scissors. Um, and we'll do the same process as we're, we're talking through this. I'll have the detective. Um, Glove up. And first I'll have him show you the box where item, we're talking about item D1. For the jury's purpose, that's been yes. marked as exhibit number 142 in our case. Is that the item labeled scissors that you, I think you previously talked about some of the blood you found? Yes. All right, we'll go ahead and have the detective uh, display those for the jury. Uh, and I'll ask you some questions. Um, same uh, four possible persons of interest uh, in, in using StarMix, and what were your results here? The swabbing from the handles of the scissors, I detected a two-person mixture with at least one male. And uh, did you reach some conclusions uh, regarding those persons of interest? Bart Halderson um, was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the profile if it is a mixture of H1 than it is a mixture of H2. Okay. And Krista Halderson? The same result. Uh, at least one quadrillion li more likely to observe that profile than an unknown person? Yes. Okay. The, the number quadrillion is a, is a large number? Yes. Uh, how large of a number is that? It's a one with 15 zeros after it. Okay. Uh, and here, Mitchell uh, and Chandler uh, excluded? Yes. Okay. Um, we don't need to display it again, but here, obviously, uh, you did. there was some additional staining on the scissors, item D2. Yes, I took swabbings from the staining on the blade of the scissors. Okay, and uh, the jury already saw that, but the scissors, uh, but what were your conclusions uh, or, or reached here? It was a two-person mixture with at least one male. Again, Bart Halderson was at least one, quadri one quadrillion times more likely to observe this DNA profile as a mixture of H1 than if it is H2. Krista Halderson, it was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe this DNA profile as a mixture resulting from H1 than if it is a mixture resulting from H2. Mitchell Halderson was excluded and Chandler Halderson was excluded. Okay. Uh, next item we're going to talk about and we'll have the detective assist us is uh, your item E1 for purposes of the jury. We're talking about uh, item or exhibit 141, uh, which is the broken saw blade, I believe testimony was reportedly recovered from the Irwin Road property. So we'll have the detective um, just pull that out as we discuss it. Yes. And you were answering the question, is that in fact the item uh, E1 from the lab? Yes. Okay, we'll have the detective remove it. And as he carefully does that, um, tell me about your conclusions using StarMix here. So I detected a partial low-level two-person mixture with at least one male. 
Art Halderson the result was very strong support for inclusion, and it was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile as a mixture resulting from H1 than if it's a mixture resulting from H2. And then it, Krista, Mitchell, and Chandler uh, were uninformative? Yes. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about the uh, all-way handsaw. Um, I think you labeled it item uh, F, so Frank, and then sub-designated uh, F1 was the, the swabbing you took? Yes. Okay, and uh, for everyone's purposes, that's exhibit 140. I'm sorry for the delay. Obviously, the detective wants to change his gloves each time, um, but we'll have him show you uh, exhibit number 140 for our purposes. Is that item F for your purposes? Yes. Okay. And we'll have the detective open that up, display it for the jury. Um, and while you describe the results, uh, what were your results on item F1? I detected a two-person mixture with at least one male. Um, Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe this DNA profile. If it's a mixture resulting from H1, then resulting from H2. Crystal Halderson, it was very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile as a mixture from H1 than from H2. And Mitchell Halderson and Chandler Halderson were excluded. Okay. Um, next, and of course, the detective will go through the process of, of changing gloves. We're gonna talk about item G. Um, in this case, which is the pruning shears uh, for the jury's purposes, uh, exhibit number 139, uh, purportedly recovered from the Irwin Road property, I believe was the testimony. And uh, we'll have the detective, um, one second. And we'll have the detective continue to show him, um, but we're gonna start talking about the results because there's numerous results as to this one. Uh, tell us about um, item G1. G1 was the swapping of the black rubber handle on the pruning shears. I detected a two-person mixture with at least one male. And the results for each individual was uh, Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it was a mixture from H1 than if it was a mixture resulting from H2. Krista Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it is a mixture resulting from H1 than if it's a mixture resulting from H2. Mitchell Halderson was excluded and Chandler Halderson was excluded. Okay, briefly, the detective's gonna open the box. I know we've all seen it before, but I just wanna make sure everyone's seeing the same thing. That's your item that we're talking about? Yes. All right, we'll go to the other swabbing you took from there, uh, which was uh, G2. Uh, what did you find here? Again, it was a swabbing of the staining on the red metal handle portion of the pruning shears. It was a two-person mixture and at least one male. Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it is a mixture resulting from H1 than if it is a mixture resulting from H2. <coughs> Krista Halderson had very strong support for inclusion is at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it is a mixture resulting from H1 than if it's a mixture resulting from H2. Mitchell Halderson was excluded and Chandler Halderson was excluded. Excellent, and uh, the detective will repackage that and you can take a seat for a second. Um, next, we're gonna talk about this item, I think we refer to as the barn tarp, um, item S1 that you previously looked at. Um, you performed this work on this item, uh, on the stainings on the barn tarp. What were you able to conclude? The swab from the stain on the barn tarp was a two-person mixture and at least one male. Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it was a mixture from H1 than if it's a mixture resulting from H2. Krista Halderson had very strong support for inclusion it was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than if it's a mixture resulting from H2. 
Mitchell Halderson was excluded and Chandler Halderson was excluded. Okay, and we don't have to read it again, but you did another swab from the same tarp, correct? Yes. And that has identical results? Yes. Bart and Krista, each one quadrillion times more likely to be observed than a, uh, a, anyone else. There's a random person. Or it was me, at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than H2. Okay. Uh, you then performed another uh, report in this case. So that's exhibit number 418, uh, correct? Yes. Okay. I'll hand you that report uh, for reference. Same format, uh, you examined a lot of items. Yes. Uh, however, it, it, many of these are swabs, correct, uh, that we're looking at here? I'd are, say half are swabs, okay. the other half were bags labeled. Okay. Uh, first thing in your report is items you identified blood on? Yes. All right, uh, let's talk about those briefly. Um, there's items starting with the letter W um, labeled paper towels. Uh, what were those? Paper towels. Yeah, and what did, what, do you have a description in general for item W, of what that was? There was a box containing several bags of what were called, uh, that contained paper towels. Okay, and you were able to identify blood on that? On four of them I tested, okay. there was blood. All right, uh, next we have um, a swab uh, reportedly recovered from the family room, uh, swab, G, uh, family room, um, in these in the items labeled G by uh, the investigators that were involved in the case? Yes. And you sub-designated that or designated as X6? Yes, there were seven or eight swabs in that one item submitted. Uh, next, you were able to identify blood on the X, item AC? Yes. Okay, and this one we'll actually want to look at. Um, so I'll have the detective come up. Um, he can grab that. I'll actually move some of this out of his way. I'm going to have the detective show you item AC. Uh, and you can just let us know, in fact, is that have the stickers from your lab uh, labeled as that item. You can take a, a look at that if you need to get up. That's fine. It has our label M21-1575 AC on the box. Sure. Uh, and uh, we'll pause on opening that until we get to the section and, and talk about um, the actual findings. Uh, but where were, on that item were you able to locate blood? Uh, do you mind if I refer to my notes? Absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, I, I did the testing to confirm for blood on the staining near the hilt of the axe. Okay. How would you describe where the hilt is? It's where the axe head and the handle meet. Okay. Next, uh, some shoes uh, recovered in this case. You labeled as items AD1 and AD2. Uh, you found blood on those shoes? Yes. Can you tell us whereabouts on those shoes you found blood? Uh, the bottoms of the shoes. And I'll have the detective uh, just show you uh, what's been marked and received in this case. And if you can look and see if your lab sticker is in fact on that. Yes, it is. Uh, there were some jeans or pants that you labeled as AE and you recovered blood there? Uh, yes. Uh, what is the difference between blood identified in this report and this next section, which we hadn't seen before, which is presumptive testing for blood positive, however, could not be confirmed? So presumptive testing for blood is what a lot of people are familiar with. It's the chemical test, and it, uh, if blood is indicated, it will turn pink. And then I went to do the confirmatory test for blood, and... I did not see two lines. I only had one line. So I could say that it was 
presumptive for blood was positive, but I could not confirm blood on those items. Okay, and those items were a swab from the living room fireplace and a swab from the south side basement area? Yes. Okay. And then what does the next section mean, just presumptive testing for blood positive? And what's different from the blood was identified section? So presumptive testing for blood was positive on the paper towels and the swabs listed, but I didn't take those on to do a confirmatory test. I took a representative sampling to confirm for blood. Okay. And the rest of these items just had the presumptive testing done. Lindsay, we're gonna mark an exhibit if you have a sticker. Uh, and those items, paper towels, swab from the family room, um, there were some swabs from the fireplace and south side basement area. Yes. Okay. Same as before, you prepared the items for analysis, meaning you, you swabbed them or did the cuttings and you did some analysis. Um, here, um, the first couple are unsuitable. Again, remind us what that means. Just means uh, I didn't detect any DNA, so I couldn't go on for further analysis. Uh, and however, you were able to perform some analysis on uh, a good deal of these items. Yes. Okay. Let's start with uh, uh, this one, a swab from the living room or the family room, excuse me, item X1A uh, and the swabbing from the stain on the sole of the shoe uh, that you had, item ADB. A, D, 2, B. Um, tell me what your conclusions were here. Uh, they were single source male profiles from the same individual and Bart Halderson was the source of those profiles. Sure. For the jury's purpose, some of the swabs we're talking about here came from the fireplace. I believe investigator Leatherberry testified uh, to some of those. Um, but here uh, we're talking about uh, the shoe and a swabbing from the family room. And you, you identified Mr. Halderson? Yes. Um, same numerical value as you previously talked about, being one in seven trillion? Yes. Okay. Swab from the family room, item X2 through X7. Um, and uh, cuttings from the stain on the jeans, item AE2 and AE3, uh, you were able to observe, uh, or able to determine a single source male profile. Tell me those results. You detected a single source male profile from the same individual. Chandler M. Halderson was the source of those profiles. And you used the phrase family room. Uh, were you aware that that was the designation being used by the investigators in certain areas of the home? They were calling areas basement or family room, things of that sort? Yes, whatever they had written on the transmittal is what we used for our description. Okay. Next we'll talk about swab from the north side of the basement items. Y1A, Y3A, Y5A, and Y6A. Um, here, these were swabs taken from the same general area. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, did you perform some analysis on them? Yes, I was able to detect single source female profiles from the same individual. And Krista Halderson was the source of those profiles. Were you able to perform blood testing on that? Swab? On those swabs? Yes. Uh, no, I did not perform blood testing on those swabs. Uh, can you tell us why not? Uh, there wasn't very much staining on those items when I examined them. And I talked to Detective Leatherberry about whether they wanted blood identified or to go on for DNA analysis. And per a conversation with him, he said he had done some blood testing on one of the items and then the other ones I would just do DNA analysis on. And were these, uh, were you aware they were swabs uh, of blood's pattern that was in a, on a safe in the basement? I knew they were from a safe, but I didn't know what they were of. Okay. 
And did you rely on Mr. Leatherberry's representations then, or at least in determining whether DNA was more important at that time? Is that how you made your decision? Yes. Okay. Next, we'll talk about the swab uh, from the living room uh, fireplace, um, item N. And so for the jury's purposes, I suppose I, I put it up there, um, item N being maybe in the center. Item N, uh, what are we looking at uh, there for a result? I had a partial low-level male profile detected, and when comparing the standards, Chandler Halderson was the source of that profile. Next, we'll talk about the south side basement area. I believe it was labeled F uh, by some of the investigators uh, involved uh, there. What were you able to determine? I detected a partial low-level three-person mixture but this profile was unsuitable for comparisons due to the limited amount of genetic information and the complexity of the mixture. Okay. Now we're going to look at some star mix results again? Yes. Okay. Um, here, talking about living room fireplace um, item O. And uh, what were you able to determine based on the swabbing from item O? I detected a partial low-level three-person mixture in at least one male. Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe this DNA profile if it was a mixture from Bart Halderson and two unknown individuals, or H1, than if it was a mixture resulting from three unknown individuals, or H2. Krista Halderson had strong support for inclusion. It was at least 10,000 times more likely to observe this DNA Profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than if it was a mixture resulting from H2. Mitchell Halderson was uninformative, and it was 2,940 times more likely to observe this DNA profile if it was a mixture from Chandler Halderson and two unknown individuals than if it was a mixture resulting from three unknown individuals, which is a moderate support for inclusion. Okay. Uh, now we're going to talk about the swab. I think uh, Mr. Leatherberry testified yesterday. Uh, area G uh, that he was able to identify. Um, you did star mix on it. What were your conclusions? I detected a partial low-level two-person mixture that contained at least one male. Bart Halderson was, had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe. This DNA profile was a mixture resulting from H1 than if it was a mixture resulting from H2. Krista Halderson was uninformative. It was at least 1,280 times more likely to observe this DNA profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than a mixture resulting from H2, which was a moderate support for inclusion, and Chandler Holderson was uninformative. Okay. Uh, next, uh, and we'll, we'll get the item out again, uh, just so we're looking at the same thing, swabbing on the staining of the ax head. I think you testified previously uh, to various areas of the ax head um, that were tested, but let's start with this one. Item AC1, so when you swabbed uh, near the axe head, uh, tell us what your results were. I did two-person mixture that it contained at least one male. Bart Halderson had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe this DNA profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than if it was a mixture resulting from H2. Krista Halderson also had very strong support for inclusion. It was at least 106 million times more likely to observe this DNA profile if it was a mixture resulting from H1 than if it was a mixture resulting from H2. M Mitchell Halderson had moderate support for exclusion. It was 2,600 times more likely to observe this mixture if it was resulting from H2 than if it was a mixture resulting from H1. And Ch Chandler Halderson was uninformative. AC2, near the hilts of the axe handle, is this where you said uh, you were able to detect blood? I identified blood, yes. Uh, could you point uh, for the jury, I know we described it previously, without touching it, the detectives holding the axe, where is, in fact, the area in which you were able to identify blood? There's a, there's a silver circle near where the axe head and the handle meet, and that's where I swapped. Okay. Uh, and I'll have the detective place it back as we're talking about this result. Uh, AC2, I know you've been, you've been reading a lot. Uh, but there uh, you found a two-person mixture with at least one male, um, and then you reached some conclusions. That is for Bart Halderson, um, uh, very strong support for inclusion? Yes. 
Krista Halderson, very strong support for inclusion? Yes. And you excluded both Mitchell and Chandler? Yes. You then swab the top part of the ax, item AC3. Uh, there, uh, you reached conclusions. Very strong support for inclusion for Bart? Yes. Very strong support for Krista? Yes. And you excluded both Mitchell and Chandler? Yes. Next, we're going to talk about a pair of shoes. And uh, I'll have the detective, if he could, uh, in a second, walk up uh, with a pair of shoes. In fact, they're already up there. Um, here in this case, you were asked to identify uh, or to examine a pair of Brooks shoes that were brought to the crime lab? Yes. And are you aware that other disciplines at the crime lab, uh, people who do footwear testing and things of that sort, they were also involved? Yes. Um, it just might be a good break or a good time to ask you. Um, a lot of different disciplines work together at the crime lab. Yes. Um, fingerprints, uh, footwear analysis, trace evidence, DNA, things like that? Yes. How do you decide what order things are tested when they come in? Um, we plop this on your desk one day. Who, who goes first? It depends on what the question is being asked of us to find. Um, some cases, if there's biological staining, we'll take our uh, samples first because sometimes the process for latent prints could destroy any um, DNA that we may want to do in the future. Sometimes items, depending on what they are, are best suited for latent prints to examine first, and then DNA. It's just a discussion between the assigned analyst on what the best, um, what is best to do first. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, you were asked to uh, swab the inside of, of the shoes near the heel, or that's what you decided to do. Why would one swab the inside of the shoes? You might want to know who was wearing them. Okay. Uh, and uh, here, uh, we're looking at the left Brooks shoe uh, in that bag that's in front of you. We don't have to do anything with it right now. It's, it's there. Um, there, uh, you reach some results, uh, and that is uninformative for BART, uh, very strong support for inclusion for Krista, um, and uninformative for Mitchell, uh, but very strong support for Chandler. Yes, it was a four-person mixture and in, that had at least one male. And you examined the other shoe as well, right? Yes. And we'll skip ahead too. Here's the right shoe. Um, and there, uh, very strong support for exclusion for Bart. You exclude Krista. Uh, you ex very strong support for exclusion of Mitchell. Uh, but very strong support for inclusion of Chandler. Yes. Uh, meaning Mr. Halderson, Mr. Chandler Halderson is the only one with the left and right shoe that had strong support for inclusion of some sort. Yes. Okay. There was a stain you previously testified about on the bottom of those shoes. Um, you labeled it sub-designation AD1B. Um, your conclusions there for the staining on the bottom of the shoes, um, Bart Halderson, strong support for inclusion? Yes. Um, Krista Halderson, very strong support for inclusion. Yes. Mitchell Halderson, moderate support for exclusion. Yes. And Chandler Halderson, moderate support for inclusion. Yes. Was that the stain that you previously testified was blood? Yes. This perhaps hasn't come into the case, but you were provided a, and we're just going to present everything, you were provided a pair of jeans at some point. Yes. And that those pair of jeans were items AE1, and you found very strong support for inclusion of Chandler, and you excluded everybody else. Yes. Your last report that you did, um, it was much shorter, I would imagine, than all of the other reports. Showing your report number 560. Uh, when was this report dated? November, November 8th, 2021. And uh, to be fair to say, the police at some point found a gun and they brought it out to you to see if there was any DNA on it? Yes. And were you able to find any? I took three swabbings from uh, the rifle, and the results had very limited human DNA, limited male DNA, which means it was unsuitable for further analysis. Okay. You couldn't draw any conclusions from it? Right. Okay. 
Are guns a, a difficult object to detect DNA on sometimes? They can be, yes. Um, do, do you examine guns often in your job? Yes. And are you always able to uh, extract DNA from somewhere on that gun when you, when you sample it? No. If you want to drink of water now might be a good time. I'm going to ask a couple questions of everyone, but we might be getting close to the end. Okay. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Cross examination. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. So a couple questions for you. Earlier, Mr. Brown mentioned something about um, the crime lab being able to only test a limited amount of items. Is that correct? They can. We can accept more, but usually we like a heads up first. Okay. Um, so I think the number 10 was used. Is that just a typical number that's assigned to homicide cases? Yes. And the state can certainly ask for more than 10 items to be tested. Yes. Um, they're not limited in the amount of items. In other words, no more than 20 items can be tested, correct? We just like to limit it just so it doesn't become very overwhelming. They can certainly ask for more to be submitted. Of course, and that makes sense. Um, now, we talked a lot about DNA in general and blood. So if I hold this pen and you swab it, my DNA is going to be on this pen, correct? Potentially, yes. And there's no blood, just take my word for it. There's no blood on this pen. Um, so you're still going to be able to pick up some DNA on that, correct? Potentially, yes. And that's why, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, sometimes when we're designating or when the crime lab was designating swabs, there was just a general swab of blah versus swab of staining of blah. Does that sound about right? Right. So is it fair to assume that if there was a staining in front of that swab or in that swab, that's testing for DNA of the staining in particular, yes? Potentially, yes. And if it just said the general swab, um, then that would be just general swabbing, no blood detected or no blood necessary, yes? Potentially, yes. Um, and just to give you a better example, let's see. If, if you want to look at your September 1st report, um, and I'm looking at, does the bottom have bait stamps for you? Do you have the page number? Yeah, I'm looking at um, 2,903. Exhibit 417. Yes. Thank you, Judge. 2903, you said? Yep. Yep. Um, so right in the middle of that page, it says swabbing of handles of scissors, correct? Yes. And then right below that, it says swabbing of staining on blades on scissors, correct? Yes. So the first one, is it safe to assume that it's just a general swab of the handles? Yes, trying to avoid any type of staining on, seen on the handle. And the second one is more specific to staining seen on, on, the, blade. on that particular item. On the blade, yes. Um, and then while we're looking at that sample of the handles in general, um, Mr. Halderson was excluded. And by Mr. Halderson, I mean Chandler was excluded. Yes. Now let's talk about the standards used. Um, and when I say standards, I'm talking about the individuals that were compared to that sample. Correct? Yes. Um, so as far as standards given, it sounds like there were just four samples or four standards that the crime lab used, correct? Those were what were submitted to the lab, yes. So if there were any other standards or any other individuals that were trying to get comparison from items, those would have been provided in your report, correct? Yes, results would have been given. Judge, can we approach? Of, of how DNA wouldn't be left on an item. For instance, if I, Ms. Vera, used the example of a pen, if I touched a pen and it was swabbed, uh, what could cause DNA to come off of, of a pen? If it was, if someone was wearing a glove, um, if they had wiped the item down after touching it. Uh, do cleaning products have any impact on DNA? 
Potentially, yes. In your work, are you able to tell particularly how a DNA, when you find no DNA, are you able to say why or why not it wasn't there? No. Um, it, it could be wiped off? Yes. And it could be cleaning products? Yes. Or it could have never been there in the first place? Correct. Okay. You are a scientist and your results are limited to those reports? Yes. Okay. No further questions. May the goodness be excused. Uh, excused, but not yes. released. Yes. Excused, yeah. but not released. And, and um, I think and we will. You take your reports, but I'll take the paper exhibits that you have, and we'll get everything else cleared up in a little bit. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. And did the state wish to proceed with some uh, additional testimony from one of the case detectives? Yes. I think uh, we'll go, ladies and gentlemen, without a break, but we'll be breaking a little bit earlier for the day as a result, if that's all right, unless anybody is needs a time uh, or a moment, then we can go forward. Hi. Go right ahead. Uh, work, I'm going to call for a limited purpose, Detective Sabrina Sims. if you could turn off the HDMI until we're ready. Oh, no, turn back on to the HDMI. No, 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 to turn oh. it off until we're oh, ready. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, right. just didn't want it to see it. Okay. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Is your name still Sabrina Sims? Yes, it is. And you are one of the two case detectives in this case. Yes, I am. I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the different areas that were searched by police um, in connection to this case. Of course, one place that was searched was the Irwin Road address in Cottage Grove, Dane County, Wisconsin. Yes. And that was searched primarily because a human torso was found on the, on the land. That's correct. And we've also talked with Greg Leatherberry and others, the 4595 Oak Springs Circle address in Windsor, Dane County, Wisconsin, was also searched by police. Yes. And that's primarily um, because uh, there, of information that came out of seeing Chandler Halderson as being the person that was seen close to where the torso was, so you were looking for a crime scene. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibits 459 through 465. If you would look at exhibits 459 through 465. As a group, would you describe those exhibits as photographs of other locations searched by the Dane County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I would. I would move exhibits 459 through 465 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received. And I would ask to publish. You may publish. And I will take the HDMI now. Attorney Raymond, is the podium in your way as far as sight lines to the witness? No, oh, it's fine okay. for me. I couldn't tell from my angle. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Brown. Okay. I think it's connected if it's turned, is it turned on? Thank you. Okay. Detective Sims, what does Exhibit 459 show? Uh, this is a drone image of the 
the backyard of the Halderson home, uh, overlooking the pond area directly behind the Halderson home. And was this pond area searched? Yes, it was. Tell me about that. How did the Dane County Sheriff's Office search the pond? Um, it was definitely um, done with a lot of uh, thought with cooperation with the pond owner, uh, all of the residents that lived on the pond. Uh, we had to get consent from all of them. Um, obviously, we've taken in consideration the wildlife and fish um, around the pond. We didn't want to disturb um, that as, as part of our decision making. Um, we searched the pond because of the the proximity to the residents, uh, being directly behind the residents. Um, at the point the decision was made to search the pond, um, we were still looking for uh, numerous items of evidence. Um, if you can see in this photograph, um, I guess it would be on the right side, um, that is our dive team truck. Um, we had our dive team uh, assist in part of the search. Um, so they obviously got into the water. Um, they also um, had difficulty in the search because as you can see, there's numerous weeds uh, growing in the pond. So as the search started, um, some of the divers uh, who are Dane County Deputy Sheriffs, um, they just were um, struggling with the uh, environment and the weeds below the water. So a decision was made uh, in cooperation again with the, the pond owner. Um, and we also used uh, Dane County Parks um, to assist in cutting weeds out of the park or out of the pond. So we brought in a weed cutter um, and methodically cut weeds out so that the divers would have an easier time searching the area um, to try to get to the bottom of Did the pond. Did the team also search all the weeds that they cut to make sure no items of evidence were missed? Yes, we did. Um, that happened over uh, two days, actually. Uh, the weeds were cut, um, taken on a, off of, on a conveyor belt, uh, transported to the Dane County Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, laid out uh, in different batches, and um, searched by hand, and also a cadaver canine um, ran around the uh, different piles of weeds as well. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 460, is this just a different view of the pond? Yes, it is. And that's after some of the water has been drained. Is that fair? That is fair to say. Um, I should backtrack. Our The decision initially was to drain um, the pond to assist the divers. Um, as is with any plan, sometimes that changes because as the water uh, was decreasing in the pond, it actually made it more difficult for the divers. Um, so at that point, uh, the decision was made to cut the weeds. Being more diff did it become more difficult because of the mud? <sighs> yes, it, the, uh, the bottom, um, from what I was told, um, it was, um, there was a lot of silt at the bottom. Um, the divers were kind of getting stuck, um, you know, as they were trying to get to the bottom, um, feeling by hand, um, but also, uh, you know, with their feet. And at the end of the day, was anything of evidentiary value located in the pond? No, it was not. Now I'm going to show you what's already been received as Exhibit 532. This is the Snapchat um, that the girlfriend Kat Melander took um, of Chandler at the Roxbury location. Um, did that lead to a search? Uh, yes, it did. And that's the search that we've heard previously about where the legs of Mrs. Halderson were collected. Yes. Okay. Um, we heard uh, Greg Leatherberry yesterday talk about um, how the trash can tested positive for blood. Based on that information, what, if any, searches did the Dayton County Sheriff's Office perform? Um, so we actually had talked about um, the red staining that Deputy Le Leatherberry observed on the garbage can, and um, his plan was to test that staining, and if it tested positive for blood and then human blood, uh, we had made the decision that we were going to search a landfill. Um, so we had a detective um, 
I guess, basically follow um, from where the truck picked up the trash at the Windsor residence, where that trash went, which ultimately was a transfer point, and it ended up in a landfill in Jefferson County, uh, a waste management landfill. Uh, we also had confirmation that the trash went out on Monday, July 5th, uh, 2021. Um, and we had that information um, because we know the route, but also because of the surveillance video that we got from 111 Oak Springs. So we actually saw the garbage can and the recycle bin wheeled to the curb by Chandler. Um, so based on the time frame from when the garbage went out to when we had started our investigation, we felt that it was necessary to um, search the landfill, knowing that that task would be um, you know, very, um, very challenging, um, something that, um, in my experience as a detective, um, or actually as the Sheriff's Office for Dane County, we have never done. And I'm showing you Exhibit 461. What in the world is Exhibit 461? Um, again, this is a drone image of the landfill. Um, it's the Deer Track Landfill in Watertown, which is in Jefferson County. Um, this was taken as part of our um, like recon of uh, the area. This was the area that um, Detective Mayor Hoffer uh, had worked with the landfill management and determined that this was the cell area. Uh, where we believed that the trash from the Halderson residence ended up. Okay. And Exhibit 462, how would you describe Exhibit 462? Again, this is just a, a drone image um, overlooking the area. Um, you can see, I guess, to the far left um, of the screen, um, that is Interstate uh, 94. Um, and then kind of directly uh, in the center of the screen towards the bottom is the specific cell or trash area we were going to be searching. Um, um, Exhibit 463. Could uh, you please describe that for yes, the jury? Yes, 463 is, um, I guess, as the process was going, um, this was taken, um, as you can see, there's uh, plastic bags all over the place. There's wood. Um, there's actually an individual standing uh, pretty much in the center, um, uh, upper center of the picture. He's wearing a uh, yellow shirt and blue hard hat. Um, he's standing uh, basically in the cell area that they searched. Um, the cell area, if I remember right, um, I want to say it was 50 feet wide by 50 feet, um, 50 feet wide by 50 feet, and then like 10 feet deep. It was a total of 20,000 cubic feet that they searched. And was it basically they went piece by piece? They did. Um, again, that was, um, you know, meetings we had to logistically plan um, how to do that safely uh, because of the environment you're going in. Um, the safety equipment that was needed. We actually, um, deputies that worked at the landfill for the two weeks that we did that um, had to take an OSHA training um, before um, participating in the search. Um, and that was done with, you know, the best safety measures we could um, over the time period that we were there. Exhibit 464. Um, 464 is yet another um, image of the individual standing uh, more for just for reference to determine um, like how deep the trash is um, and the individual standing there um, he's approximately five feet nine um, so uh, just for like a reference point of what you're looking at again he's standing in the center of um, compacted trash the camp the trash is compacted numerous times um, it's smashed from the time it gets taken from the curb in the truck to the transfer point. Um, it's actually ran over uh, with, um, it's almost like spikes um, smashed down to try to obviously tear it apart and smash it, which made it very difficult to search. You can see the torn uh, pieces of paper, plastic um, items you really can't even make out um, within this image. And then finally, exhibit 465, this another is just picture of the, the dump search? Yes. This is just a close up again, just um, showing, try to just show like the, trying to show the depth of the trash that was being searched. 
Now, did uh, the search team come across any items of blood? Uh, they did. <laughs> and um, did those end up being of any evidentiary value? No, they did not. Um, I should say that we were working in conjunction with the medical examiner's office and the forensic um, anthropologist, Dr. Christina Figueroa Soto as well. Um, in case we did come across anything, um, we did, there were um, some bones that were found. Um, none of those determined uh, to be human bone. Um, you know, there was medical waste, um, bags of blood, stuff like that. And uh, about how many people were involved in that search? Um, I would say each day, um, it was approximately 10 to 12 people um, for a total of 10 days, uh, that same um, amount each day. Okay, and um, did you receive any tips from citizens um, throughout this investigation? Uh, we did. About how many of those would you estimate? I would say between 30 and 40. Um, and was each tip followed up on? Yes. Um, did one of those tips uh, result in a search of the Lord of Love Church? Yes, in it did. Windsor, Wisconsin? Sorry. Yes, it did. Um, how long, and can you just tell me about that property and how it was searched? Um, yep, so that tip came in, um, I want to say two weeks into the investigation. I want to say it was July 17th that we actually uh, searched that area. Um, the church itself is uh, located um, south of the Halderson home. Uh, so in close, um, distance wise to the home. Um, so we put a search team together based on the information from the tipster that there was an odor coming from um, some of the the grass property that was behind um, the church. There's also like a walkway around that area. Um, ultimately, it was determined there was actually a um, like a, some sewer work being done in that area. Um, we did search it with a large search team, a cadaver canine and ultimately located nothing. Did you guys also search the town of Burke Park, which is right outside of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin? Yes, we did. Why did you search that area? Um, uh, throughout the investigation, we were talking to numerous witnesses, um, people that um, you know knew Chandler Halderson. Um, we had received information from some of the people that we interviewed um, that it was a park that Mr. Halderson um, or Chandler uh, would frequent or had been to in the past. Um, it's a very rural park. Um, there's a waterway there. There's um, a bridge and uh, a large field you can walk across. Um, so we thought using our resources on the same day of the Lord of Love search, we would search the town of Burke Park um, to determine if we could find any evidence there. And ultimately, we did not. Was the Pine Island Wildlife Area in Portage, Wisconsin searched? Yes, it was. Why was that area searched? Um, at that point in the investigation, when we um, we decided to search that area, um, we had received um, cell phone records um, from Chandler's cell phone. Um, so this had been weeks into the investigation. Um, we worked with an analyst who mapped um, his cell phone records, and we had determined that there was a trip to uh, the Pine Island Wildlife Area, which is in Columbia County, uh, which is a an area that is along the Wisconsin River. Uh, Mr. Or Chandler was out there um, late in the evening um, between 10.30 and 11 at night. Um, his cell phone was in that area for several minutes and we just thought um, based on all of the information we had so far in our investigation, how we had found um, at this point, uh, Krista Halderson's legs at the Wisconsin River in Roxbury, uh, we thought we needed to search that area up in Portage as well. And does that area run along the Wisconsin River? It does. And did you have dive, your dive team out to that location? Yes, we did. We actually conducted um, a search over a couple of different days. Um, the Just the landscape um, overall is challenging. There's bogs and different um, water, um, I guess, waterways. Uh, it, the area in which we searched, it was right along Levy Road, which is 
a levee um, that butts up to the Wisconsin River. Um, that river itself, uh, the water level fluctuates quite a bit, um, and it also has a strong current. Um, so we had searched it um, on foot with search teams one day, um, and ultimately deciding that we would try and put our um, divers into the water after a cadaver canine had alerted um, along the banks of one of the search areas. Um, we did, the Dane County Sheriff's Office dive team did go out there one day, uh, also with the DNR um, and Columbia County Sheriff's Office. And one of our divers um, did get in the water um, and immediately upon getting in the water, uh, it was realized that it was very dangerous. Um, it was something um, that our dive team had not done before um, in the Wisconsin River. Um, due to the current and just how um, strong the current was, um, it was such a dangerous situation um, that we we basically pulled him back into the boat and uh, did no more searching there. But you mentioned a cadaver dog did alert along this shore. Yes, uh, we utilized uh, a couple of different officers that have uh, cadaver canines that are um, employed at the City of Madison Police Department and we did a mutual aid request for their assistance. No further questions at this time. Cross-examination. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Detective. You can return back to the table. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are at a point where I'm advised uh, by the state it is a good point to break. Um, I want to let you know that back when we began uh, uh, and information provided to you during jury selection on Monday a week ago, I indicated that we had set aside four weeks. Uh, I can tell you with confidence that uh, I don't know if this case will finish this week or next week, but you do not, and there's no, I think, conceivable way that a fourth week will be necessary to the extent you even remember me saying that or or uh, if I did say it, I know um, uh, when we were planning, um, we set aside more time than we thought might be necessary so that we had that time. So I just wanted to let you know that for now, for your purposes in planning, that uh, um, the, uh, the week after next, uh, you won't be here, but I make no statements or promises about next week. Um, obviously, we know that we had committed to a three-week time period here uh, with certainty. And um, I wanted to tell you that um, the uh, state is uh, proceeding and seeking to present as much evidence as we can each day, even if we're stopping a little bit early today. Um, I think it's a wise thing to do. Um, we've been a little off schedule a bit this, this day, and there has been a good deal of information to take in this day. So uh, we'll adjourn at this time. I'll ask you again to not take anything or allow anything to occur to you that would cause you to be exposed to discussions or to engage in discussions about the case or to learn anything or seek out any information about the case until we see you tomorrow morning. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at the usual time. Uh, we've been remarkable in being able to start um, uh, on time most of the days, and I hope that continues. I'll see you ready to go at 845, weather permitting. Thank you. All right.